So uh, good morning, or I don't know, good afternoon or good evening. I truly don't know. Uh, here in Krakow, uh, my name is Anna Niedzielc. It's morning. I would like to welcome you. And together with Torsten Vetisch, who is actually in Göttingen or in Bremen, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I live in Göttingen and I work in Bremen. Yes, so uh, very warmly welcome. And it's a panel that we are very happy to convene titled Rules and Bodies in Religious Context. And it is the second panel organized officially by the CEF Working Group on Ethnology of Religion. And yesterday, I hope some of you could attend the panel uh, convened by Jan Peter Margre and Victoria Hegner on religion and nature. Um, if no, you, you will be able to watch actually the videos, I think, after the conference. Anyway, just let us start. We are having some withdrawals and some last minute changes, but uh, due to our wonderful nomadic team, everything is online the way it will be. However, one small change, maybe you listened to discussion with Clara as she has a very tense situation at home. She will be presenting as the last person in the morning or we will switch Clara as a sixth presenter uh, for the, well, later session, afternoon or late morning session. I don't know about the timing. Mm, uh, and yeah, we were thinking about the topic. So we really decided, okay, if um, we think about religion and crossing the rules and asking about uh, transgression, actually the body might be a topic. And that's, hence uh, we invited, uh, invited papers uh, related to somehow, yes, uh, issue of the body and rules and, uh, and religion. So I think we should start. The organization will be as follows. Uh, we'll have four or five papers, hopefully five. Each presenter will have 12 minutes for a presentation. And uh, please collect your questions to everyone. You can send questions online also via chats, and then hopefully we'll have enough time for discussion that uh, will involve all the presenters. So uh, that the idea is to have discussion after all presentation. So, okay, I will be the first one. So uh, and I will yeah, please Torsten, just cut me when I uh, just try to speak longer than twelve minutes. <laughs> right. Um, so uh, I share my screen as a co-host of this panel. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Anna Njetwitz to you. She is a cultural anthropologist employed as associate professor at the Institute of Ethnology and Cultural Anthropology at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. Her main research interests are anthropology of religion, visual anthropology, and anthropology of senses, as well as space and movement, critical heritage, and ethnographic ethnographic dialogic methodology. She's going to speak about a child of God must mind how she dresses Catholic fashion in Ghana to us. Anna, you have the floor. Okay, so thank you, Torsten, for introduction that you already know my title. It's a quote from a chat of the Catholic group uh, that I met when I was working in Ghana on my previous project and that I've been following till nowadays. I'm coming back to Ghana hopefully next month. Uh, anyway, what I will be presenting is a sort of like more research question opening my new project, but yes, connected with Ghana and Catholic fashion, especially female dresses in, uh, in the Catholic uh, church. Mm, so yes, as you see on pictures, dressing, uh, church dressing is very important and it's a matter of the collective identity in religious uh, Christian groups in Ghana, as well as the uh, personal individual identity. Uh, well, well, I will start with a snapshot uh, from, from my previous field work. Uh, so when after a few months stay in one Roman Catholic church parish, in central part of Ghana, where I was focusing on lived Catholicism. Uh, one of my very close collaborators and indeed a friend and a very active parish member, also a local farmer, whom you can see here, uh, his nick is No Way, brought me a farewell gift. So he handed me a plastic bag and I opened it. And well, uh, when I opened it, yeah, it was a, a dress. A dress, and he said, okay, surprise, surprise, you are leaving, but you are getting a proper Ghanaian church dress. Uh, 
Well, I was not very surprised with the way a proper Ghanaian church dress looks like. Yes, it was covered with crucifixion images and the material, the cloth was dedicated to a local shrine of Our Lady of Sorrows. Uh, I was neither surprised that a gift, well, it was a farewell gift, but was also a Saint Valentine Day gift, uh, which is, uh, well, sort of a pretty local tradition in Ghana to give gifts to friends for a Valentine Day. And uh, very often gifts, personal gifts are very often con connected with attire, with clothes, uh, with dresses. So yes, I was not surprised. But what surprised me was my own reaction, which was in a way very bodily and very visceral reaction. And then after that, when I was reflecting anthropologically on that moment um, of my well, so-called visceral reaction was this moment of pretextual ethnography, as, my, as I might call it after the Polish anthropology Tomasz Rakowski. So it was my affective, but also sensational feeling that, yes, well, at this moment, it's too much. Well, I've been doing field work. I was doing ethnography, sharing many things with uh, my uh, collaborators in the field. But yes, I really cannot wear that dress in crucifixions. Uh, and of course, I had to do it. <laughs> I had to take out the dress feed it, post to this photo, smiling and being happy. But I remember my very mixed feelings. And then I was thinking about that. Why? Why the dress, wearing this dress was, uh, well, was sort of such a complex and emotional, uh, brought such a complex and re emotional reaction. Uh, why was I reluctant to put on this crucifixion dress as I started to name that dress in my mind? Why? This moment was too much for me as an uh, ethnographer. And yes, indeed, it made me thinking that it's a very personal and very intimate relation between our bodies and our clothes, between how we do present ourselves to, well, ourselves, but also to others. And that indeed the body shapes us in so many intimate Mm, uh, intimate ways. So was it because I do not identify with Roman Catholicism, even though I was born and brought in Roman Catholic family, but again, not in African context, but in Polish context, where, well, a dress covered with holy images wouldn't be acceptable as the religion is connected mm, with something, well, uh, spiritual and not so close to, well, very direct uh, connection between body and images. Uh, well, this well-fitting and also attractive dress, which I could feel it made me look attractive in a way, uh, caused those various thoughts and actually posed many questions. Uh, another thing was also that maybe uh, being born in, well, socialist Poland and remembering uniforms from my primary school, I don't like uniforms and that sort of dresses work in Ghana also as a sort of uniforms where people wear them together to reveal their communal bonds. So yes, definitely I realize yes, uh, my ethnographic and anthropological position um, brought all those questions and, and in a way opened my, uh, my new research that now I'm focusing on Catholic women. And one of the questions I, I would like to pose is role of dresses, Catholic dresses and bodies, and what can we learn from this relation? So to start with that, we need a broader context. Of course, what is an African dress? And the term African dress, African fashion, African style, those terms are very popular nowadays and they circulate really globally and on different levels because they are being used internationally uh, by very well-known designers, uh, African designers or desi African designers living in diaspora. Very often those terms are being discussed, also contested and questioned. But I work in provincial uh, Ghana in, well, small town and villages in central part of the country. And very often I was encountering this term African dress. And as in that case of my 
dress in crucifixion. It was, yes, this is a proper African dress, or this dress is a proper Catholic, or this dress is a proper uh, Christian uh, Christian dress. Mm, so, yes, um, I realized that dresses reappear really as a very uh, creative field for various people, in my case, Catholics, especially Catholic women, who do show up in certain attires in church. And it's very important. Very often those dresses are being produced by their, uh, by them uh, or by, you know, just uh, local seamstresses and local dressmakers. And a lot of like creativity is being in place. Also combining uh, various patterns with secondhand dresses, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, However, <laughs> what is being uh, today transformed into African dress has a very long history. And the term has a very specific history connected, of, of course, with colonial times and missionary activities. And uh, to try to put things really short, uh, I might say we can talk about invention of African dress and African Christian dress by Europeans, by really whites for Africans. Mm, uh, so it was connected with the long history of colonialism colonization, with appearance of official uniforms, especially school uniforms, but then also military service uniforms. uniforms. And in the case of um, Christian communities, of course, those were also school uniforms. But in case of women, it was a very precisely directed uh, missionary activities directed to uh, putting clothes, putting modest and decent clothes on uh, on Christian women in uh, Christian women in Africa. And here we are having those discourses on nudity as uh, discussed by many researchers who study history of the European gaze on Africans and African continent. I will only quote one person, Adeline Mescalier here, who in an introduction to her, well, edited volume, Dirt, Undress and the Difference, is mentioning that, quote, to sartorially committed Europeans unable to recognize that seemingly naked bodies could be fully dressed. Uh, the scanty clothing worn by people in distant lands unambiguously signed cultural poverty and savage innocence. Naked, nakedness implied darkness, disorder, and pollution. Uh, for, uh, for Christians, the body was essentially corruptible. Such corruptibility was further enhanced in nakedness when the weak, ugly, or ridiculous nature of human bodies, as well as their erotic qualities, could be made more visible. And there is a whole discussion uh, what was nakedness in European concept and how actually, as for instance, uh, Esther and John Woody were pointing what West Westerners or Europeans were uh, defining as nakedness, what was not a nakedness from a, well, native point of view, as we can say. Also, we can think about a uh, conversion that was being implemented by missionaries and was connected with change of an attire, which is still a sort of a practice in many Christian communities in, uh, in West Africa. On the other hand, the local creativity and grassroots creativity and, uh, co well, actually recreating various assemblages of so-called traditional ideas on clothes or African ideas on clothes and missionary ideas of clothes um, were very, very strongly present. And uh, I here use this term uh, long conversations um, proposed in various other contexts by Jean and John Komarov, but we can really discuss also, uh, well, creation of African attire in that, uh, in that term. So- uh, 10 minutes are already gone. So, yeah. Okay, African dress in contemporary Africa. So I will just try to jump into sum up. Uh, so what we can see, we can see implementation of local patterns and especially in the Roman Catholic Church uh, with the idea of inculturation, we can see 
that apart from, well, uh, African dresses implemented in missionary times, we are having those post-independence uh, ideas like implementing Adinkra symbols, which are connected with the Ashanti culture, uh, as well as Adinkra cloths. Uh, so special patterns, black patterns on white clothes. Uh, yeah, the Shiki internationally known pattern, which got Africanized as well as, um, uh, as well as Kente, this, well, checkerboard thing is a Kente cloth, again, connected with, uh, with, uh, with the Ashanti region. Um, what, just to sum up somehow, what I might say that uh, indeed what I try to observe is now the sort of uh, local creativity and personal cre creativity versus uh, control over bodies and clothes from the community, but also, of course, from the uh, church hierarchy and discussion about what is a proper African dress, what can you wear, what really indeed people do wear to the church and when and where the conflicts appear. And also a very personal attitude towards uh, dresses, something that appeared in my snapshot that, yes, dress is very close to our bodies and very close to people's religiosity indeed. So I can use here this idea of uh, dressing and attires as embodied experience of, uh, of belief because we deal here with identity formations and their dynamics, uh, this close relation between bodies and the question about control and empowerment. So I will stop here and uh, one minute more. Uh, thank you so much and thank you for your attention. I need to stop sharing. Thank you very much, Anna. And as we said, it is the idea to do the discussion at the end of the session collectively. So if you have any questions concerning Anna's presentation, please write it down in order to save it for the end of the session. We would like to continue with Alexi Moine. Is that pronounced correctly? Uh, it's okay. It's actually a French name, so it should, would be Moine, but Moine is, is perfectly fine. Alexi Moine is a doctoral student uh, at the Department of Culture um, and uh, History and Cultural Heritage at Helsinki University. He is studying incantations in Ilomansi, Northern um, Karelia, um, focusing on 19th century um, incantations. Uh, yeah, and his presentation today is also related to this general uh, PhD project, and it is entitled The Construction of a Christian Body in Northern Karelian Charms. Alexi, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction and for inviting me to this panel. Uh, I'm really happy to present my, my work here. Uh, I hope you can all see my screen and hear me well. Yes, great. Um, so, I'll start. Motherless evil, leave the skin of this poor human, stop breaking the Christ in one. Um, that's what a charmer says in a healing charm that was collected in the village of Mekriarvis in the parish of Ilomansi in North Karelia uh, in 1845 by the collector D.E.D. Europeus. This char the charmer in this charm is addressing the cause of the illness, uh, who is breaking the rules of the world in introducing unbalance in the universe by coming inside the body, um, i.e. under the skin of the patient. So facing this crisis, the charmer must restore the balance by playing with the rules of the world and um, heal the human body here understood as a Christian body. So just some contextual information about those charms. Um, they were part of everyday life in North Karelia in the 19th century uh, when they were collected in, in the frame of uh, folklore collections in, in um, like this context of nationalism in Finland. Uh, they are Kalevalamita poems, so I won't enter into de details of, of uh, that uh, metric, in the metrical details, but um, they their function uh, was to ensure and to protect the well-being, uh, that is, the health and the wealth of the individuals and the community. I concentrate myself on uh, a corpus that was collected in Ilomansi, North Korea, that you can see on the map. Uh, and it contains about uh, 500 charms that 
were published in the SCOVR uh, database uh, available online, and most of them are healing charms. But we can also find uh, interesting features in uh, other genres, such as love charms or charms for protection of the cattle. Um, so even though, uh, because of the interest of the first scholars um, in the myth mythological aspect of the charms, uh, they were mostly preserved as texts. Um, I understand charms above all as performances that are uh, involving the body of the charmer and the body of the patient. And I argue that they have to be understood also in the context of lived religion and especially lived Christianity um, or everyday Christianity as they are part of the everyday actions and beliefs of the people uh, who were living in, in the parish. And that shows how they uh, interpreted in their own ways, in their vernacular ways, the uh, teachings and of the uh, Christian church. So um, healing charms are concerned with the uh, body, the well-being of the human body. And uh, so that's why I'm, I'm interested in the image of the body that is constructed in, in the charm, in the text. Uh, and so also the place of the body in the whole universe. So uh, in order to understand uh, how the healing works and how the charmer is negotiating with the rules of the world to heal the sick or wounded body. Uh, so what I'm doing is uh, a close reading of those texts um, because we have uh, mainly texts from, from, from this time. Uh, in, in the frame of what uh, Philip Escola calls uh, the analogical thinking or the analogical ontology and through the healing ritual, uh, relations between separate beings, uh, between distinct singularities are uh, constructed. And, um, and there's a continuity between those beings that, that then appears in, in the ritual. So what I will do uh, is that I will follow somehow the dramaturgy of the ritual and following the journey of the illness uh, and uh, of the healing. So one of the first things that the charmer needed to do was to understand where the illness uh, or the wound comes from. Um, so to understand, to find the origins of this illness, as in the example um, here. Uh, so the charmer is asking the, the illness uh, where it comes from. So from where problem have you become involved? Uh, illness of he, see, gotten entangled, to break the crescent, to overturn the baptized, to injure the one who was made, um, to eat bloody dog, hand of mana, to tear the skin of the poor human, the form made by a maiden, the body brought by a virgin. So interesting things here uh, in this example um, then that I would like to emphasize are, uh, first of all, the presentation of uh, the sick body um, in its materiality uh, as it comes from the, the womb of a woman brought by a virgin, uh, a maiden, and I will come back to that later. Um, and uh, so words kind of bring to the stage the sick body uh, that is most probably present in these healing performances. And it character like they characterize it as a uh, Christian. So uh, we have like the Christian body, the baptized, um, and uh, probably uh, with this um, maiden and virgin uh, influence of the image of uh, the Virgin Mary. Um, on the other side, on the uh, on the um, yeah, other side, we have the illness uh, that is seen as a threat uh, coming under the skin, uh, threatening the the body, and um, that is uh, somehow coming um, to the place uh, where she where, where it wouldn't like it shouldn't be, uh, where it's like turning everything, uh, overturning and and changing changing the rules of the world. So this idea of baptism that we can find in the characterization of the patient, the human body, uh, is also found in uh, the characterization of the illness uh, in some charms. And it's just that it's an inverted baptism, as in the example here. So it's the myth uh, of the Kipotista, the maiden of pain, uh, where she gives birth to uh, nine sons and uh, is looking for someone to, to baptize them. And in this, this example, uh, so she finds uh, St. John and asks him, uh, Johannes, Saint Knight, come to Christian the child. 
Uh, I do not christen the evils and do not baptize the horrors. I have christened the cre creator, baptized the omnipotent. Herself, this evil pagan herself, she christened her sons, gave a name to her children. And then she gives the name of the illnesses to her nine sons. Um, so in this example, St. John is asked to baptize the children, but he refuses, knowing that they are evils, um, or at least going to be a threat in the future to human beings. So uh, the person who's baptizing the, the illnesses uh, is their own mother, who's characterized as an evil pagan, um, and is the complete opposite of the, the saint, uh, St. John, of the priest who, who, who should be baptizing the uh, the, the children. So in this way, um, there's this parallel that is very important between uh, the illness and the human body. But let's expand a little bit, uh, because this understanding of the Christian body can be understood as uh, for the whole community, who's all, also quite often in the charms uh, mentioned as uh, so the people of the cross or um, the, the church. So the church is actually uh, in some cases uh, understood as the as one of the backbones of the world um, around which everything is is evolving um, and in the following charms or just this uh, very short uh, excerpt uh, the charm is also looking for the origin of the illness and um, asking uh, where it can come from and we have three verses uh, where the church is mentioned so oh is the church uh, in in like round circles or um, the sacred place in wells uh, broken from the basis of the cross so everything is is like like in this um uh, tempest of, of things uh turning and and so the illness is really not only uh, threatening the individual but the whole uh the whole places so um what is interesting then is that the um uh, once the origin is understood we need to conjure the illness and this is an example they are conjure you to the lands which are not frightened the places without priests they are conjure you to the meadows without name to the name that is unknown oh you evil pagan they are conjure you to the side of the colorful church next to the tahol to the side of the there are there are the other murderers the eternal evildoers so uh, the illness needs to be to the place where it belongs, so it's on the other side of the church where all the murderers and evildoers um, uh, are part of. So this is the way of uh, restoring the balance of the universe. Um, then, um, in order to do so, uh, the charms are often um, based on uh, hierarchical um, thinking uh, with the parents that play an important role. So we have two examples here, uh, mainly the parents of the illness first. So go he to hell, evil, flee to your land, wicked to your fathers. Your father is weeping, your mother worrying in bloody clothes in gory garments. So here again, the materiality, the physicality is quite important uh, and, and like um, underlining this uh, uh, trouble that is, is happening and uh, and the parents are seen as responsible of uh, their children so their, the illnesses um, evil actions on the, the other hand the charmer in himself can ask for help from uh, his own parents so here Jesus and Mary uh, from there I ask for help and there I cry for relief from my father Jesus from my mother Mary so you can see again this parallelism between uh, those two agents and I'm uh, short, soon concluding, but then before that, um, in charms, we have also metapragmatic elements uh, that are uh, showing the actual performance with the two bodies that are in relation, so the charmer and the patient. Uh, so just a few examples. Uh, water is the older of the brothers with which Christ was Christ and baptized the omnipotence. So the water is used as an unguent uh, to, in the touching, so making the relation between the two bodies and making also relation between the patient and Christ. So as Christ was baptized, uh, the patient is uh, healed by the water that is used. And then the charmer himself can uh, become God or Jesus or Mary, depending on the charm, uh, and 
talk about his own actions. So where I say my words come the words of God, where I put my hands come the hands of God. So uh, he's in this way channeling um, channeling the, the power uh, of the counter world or the other world. So just to summarize, uh, illnesses and wounds represent a form of disorder in the world and uh, because they threaten the human body and the Christian community. So in other words, uh, breaking the rules of the universe, that is what the illness do, results in the disease of the patient. What the healer is doing then is that is he's bending the rules of the world uh, through his own knowledge of charms and, and uh, mythology to restore the well-being of the patient. And this is uh, possible because of the analogies and parallelism between the human body and other beings, creatures, elements from the universe. And uh, the healing ritual, the charm performance is uh, those creating relations between those elements and um, and making possible the, uh, the fight between them. Um, and in this way, uh, it also shows the vernacular interpretation of uh, some elements of Christianity and, and the order of the world uh, that are used then in, in a different uh, context. So um, this is all. So uh, I thank you very much for your attention and uh, looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexi. That was right in time and gives us the possibility to directly continue with um, Bartosz, uh, who is a PhD student at the Institute of Ethnology and Cultural Anthropology at Jagiellonian University in Krakow, and uh, is undertaking a PhD project on local healing practices in Poland. He's going to be talking about cross-border cults and local religious healing practice. Uh, thank you for the invitation and thank you for um, your um, introduction. Um, I conduct um, research on um, the local uh, worship. Uh, um, um, on the local worship of uh, Saint Rita and Saint Charbel in the context of um, religious practices aimed at healing from disease and um, alleviation of suffering. Um, I'm going to talk um, uh, to you about um, how these both uh, cross-border cults look like in the local um, dimension. Um, I would especially uh, like to draw your attention uh, to examples of local religious healing um, practices. Uh, Sant Rita of Castia was an Italian nun who lived um, at the turn of um, 14th and 15th uh, centuries. Uh, Saint Charbel was um, a 19th uh, century Maronite monk and hermit from uh, Lebanon. Uh, and they are uh, sa saints um, of um, the Catholic Church. Um, what do both of these uh, characters have in, in common? Uh, firstly, um, a common day of uh, worship. Every 22nd of uh, the month, uh, worships uh, are held at the main place um, of cult uh, of both, uh, both saints. Uh, in Kastia, in Italy, and uh, in Annaia, uh, in Lebanon. Uh, secondly, um, the patronage of both uh, saints. Uh, Saint Rita is the patroness of um, difficult and hopeless matters. Uh, Saint Charbel is the um, intercessor uh, of the sick, uh, from who he implores um, the gift of, of healing. Uh, the white patronage of saints uh, means that the faithful who um, experience uh, misfortune, uh, disease, uh, and suffering um, turn uh, to them. Um, the local places of worship uh, of saints, uh, with the main places of cult in uh, Kastia and Annaia, uh, form um, a network of um, interconnections um, across the border. Uh, cult of Saint Rita and cult of uh, Saint um, Charbel um, are a kind of um, community uh, of uh, experience, religious practices, and um, testimonies. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, both cools have um, local um, dimensions. Uh, Saint Rita and Saint Charbel are venerated also in uh, in Krakow. Um, the relics of Saint Rita were brought to Krakow uh, by the Augustians shortly after her um, beatification in 1900. Um, the cult of Saint Rita in Krakow is associated with the uh, scalp, uh, uh, sculpture um, uh, from uh, 1944. Um, in the year 2000, uh, the cult of Saint Rita in Krakow was um, revitalized and has been growing ever since. The indulgence mass on May 22, 2000 um, inaugurated the monthly uh, devotion to Saint Rita, always celebrated on the um, 22nd day of um, each month. Um, the relics of uh, Saint Charbel was brought to Krakow by the uh, parish priest of the Holy Cross Parish in 2011. Um, this parish church is located in, uh, in the center of Krakow. Uh, four places of worship of Saint Charbel have been created in Krakow to this day. So uh, it is a really short time. It's, uh, it's only um, 10 years. Uh, mainly um, uh, monthly uh, devotions to Saint Charbel are also organi uh, organized in these places, um, but um, they uh, it takes um, place on different days of uh, the month depending on the place of worship, the twenty second, twenty eighth, or thirtieth uh, uh, day of um, each month. Um, as you can see in the photo, uh, the, uh, the devotions to Saint Rita uh, and to Saint Charbel in Krakow um, are an experiential laboratory of uh, sensory, uh, embodied and uh, material religious practices uh, through which the faithful um, experience their, um, their religion. Uh, the reading, uh, request and thanks and the blessing of roses of Saint Rita, or the blessing of an oil uh, of Saint Charbel, um, are the important elements of uh, devotions uh, in Krakow. Um, these practices engage the bodies uh, and senses, for example, smell uh, and touch uh, of uh, saints, uh, uh, saints uh, worshippers. Uh, in my opinion, uh, material objects such as um, request leaflets, uh, roses or oil uh, become, uh, became um, the subject of uh, mediation between followers and saint patron, between the community and the sacred, and finally between um, the worshippers them themselves. Um, uh, request uh, leaflets, uh, uh, small um, small pieces of paper on which worshippers uh, write uh, their requests and thanks to the sounds um, are a special form of uh, mediation. Uh, many of these requests contain um, extensive descriptions of experience and emotions related to various types of uh, misfortune, for example, health, uh, financial, work, or uh, family problems. Um, the request and thanks are read by the priest before each devotion. The request play, um, in my opinion, the request play an uh, important community building role. They are not only a form of a single expression of experience in a difficult life situation, they are also a form of, of um, experiencing human tragedies with others. Um, in my opinion of um, the, uh, in the opinion of, um, of the devotees uh, with whom I have spoken, um, the readings of the request give mutual, mutual support, while the readings of thanks uh, give hope uh, for a positive solution um, to difficult matters. 
And the second form of uh, mediation uh, is uh, um, uh, the material symbols of, of saints. Uh, roses in the cult of Saint Rita and oil uh, in the cult of uh, Saint uh, Charbel. Um, they are uh, healing med uh, medium items that are used to heal uh, sick, aching uh, parts uh, of the body. Uh, the drilled uh, petals uh, of blessed uh, rose are, uh, um, are wrapped on uh, the sore limbs, uh, drunk with water uh, or placed on the tongue and swallowed. Um, and um, at the end of each devotion to Saint uh, uh, Charbel, uh, the priest bless uh, each of the faithful with uh, Saint Charbel's oil uh, by making uh, the sign of the cross on their uh, forehead. Additionally, uh, during each service, uh, worshippers can take swaps uh, soaked with oil um, according to their uh, individual needs. Mm, the oil is applied to sore or stick places. Uh, for example, the, um, uh, uh, the uh, eyes with uh, cataracts or um, the head with uh, um, severe uh, migraine uh, pains. Uh, Saint Rita's roses and uh, Saint Charbel's oil uh, are especially important for uh, worshippers. Um, they are uh, distributed by parish communities and um, privately by individuals. They are um, also uh, communicated among the, the faithfuls and even sent by post to people uh, who cannot uh, attend uh, the, the devotion. Uh, material objects which are the careers of healing and um, testimony confirming the healing uh, are one of the important factors of uh, religious experience of misfortune and disease um, among worshippers of Saint Rita um, and Saint Charbel uh, in Krakow. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bartosz. Yes, and <laughs> it will be Thorsten now presenting. So it's my big pleasure now to introduce Thorsten Betish, who did his PhD at Göttingen University, but now he is he, he works as a at a postdoc position at the University of uh, Bremen. <clears throat> And uh, wow, I close my chat. Uh, and he is currently working on a big, huge project for his habilitation titled Religion Migration Identity in Lutheran Congregations in the USA, Brazil, and Namibia. So very global. And it seems uh, he will say something related to that project. Um, we are having presentation born in the face of the problem of identity and power religious pluralism and ethnicity in German-speaking Lutheran congregations in the USA. So please, Thorsten, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you for having the chance to speak here in front of this audience. Nobody would like to find a skeleton in his or her, his or her closet, nor does Uncle Sam, the depiction of the United States of America in this image here holding a protest note against the Russian exclusion of Jewish Americans in a sense that he wanted to use to uh, proclaim against Russia, but the skeleton emerges from the closet and shows him his own failures, in this case the American exclusion of Chinese uh, in the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. So as a figure of speech, a skeleton in the closet describes something that is undisclosed and it's not supposed to be revealed because of the damage it could potentially do to the person hiding it from outsiders. And uh, celebrated US church historian Martin Marty is using the image of the skeleton in the closet, describing uh, the situation uh, of the um, of ethnicity when it comes to US American religion. Um, 
as he had the feeling that the importance of ethnicity was being neglected by his uh, fellow researchers at the time, he found it uh, important to stress that uh, even in times where ethnic origins seem to have become less important, and people would prefer to formulate pl pluralist interpretations of the US, US uh, religious American scene, he would still um, say that um, this is um, that these contemporary interpretations tend to neglect or obscure the durable sense of peoplehood in the larger American community. And 50 years ago, when that um, essay was written, peoplehood was another term when speaking about ethnicity and identity. Uh, he felt, uh, Martin Marty felt that the religious pluralist interpretation was born in the face of the problem of identity and power. Uh, that is to say, the ideas of secularism, privatization, pluralism, denominationalism, and civil religion are not condemned altogether, but uh, he still sees uh, ethnicity as the skeleton of religion and a supporting framework in the United States of America. 50 years later, it is my endeavor to take a look at whether this skeleton still remains in the closet, if it has been disclosed and walks around freely, or if some other streams of interpretation have taken its place. I want to talk about the relig religious pluralist uh, perception of the US American religious field from the perspective of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, ELCA, on the one hand, and uh, through the eyes of German speaking Lutheran congregations belonging to the same church on the other. So my question is, to what extent does ethnicity continue to inform the understanding of denominational identity in the United States of America? And related to this is the question, how far are human bodies interpreted as bearers of signs of indifference in this context? So as I've said, I want to start by taking a look at the ELCA, which is the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. It has some 3.3 million members in about 9,000 congregations. That would be about 1% of the total U.S. population. In 1988, the ELCA um, was founded uh, as a merger of three predecessor churches, and each of these predecessor church also had its ethnic roots. The Lutheran Church in America, LCA, for example, was centered at the East Coast area and largely dominated by German, Scandinavian, and Central European immigrants until the mid-19th century, whereas the other predecessor church, ALC, American Lutheran Church, was located in the Midwest and had immigrants that came later in the 19th and 20th century as well from Germany and Scandinavia. So if you open the homepage of the ELCA today, what you will find is something like uh, the first transgender bishop is uh, put in office or uh, that we have a prayer uh, to our LGBTQIA um, siblings um, or you will find a blessing uh, concerning, uh, you, will find, you will find statements concerning racial issues. So these are really the things that pop up first when you open the homepage of the ELCA today. And you can get the idea that uh, it tries to be an advocate of diversity politics, really. Uh, in particular, I want to um, show you this 1993 statement here entitled Freed in Christ, Race, Ethnicity and Culture, uh, where it claims, uh, quote, Christ, our peace, has put an end to the hostility of race, ethnicity, gender, and economic class. End of quote. It is acknowledged that, quote, the Evangelical Lutheran Church has roots in church bodies with a strong immigrant history, as I just said, which kept the faith once delivered to the saints in ways appropriate to the cultural background of the membership. But today, the ELCA commits itself to cultural diversity, and to push this forward, it tries to implement a 10% representation of minorities such as African American, Asian, Hispanic, and Native American within its own church. While the aforementioned interest groups are encouraged, the special interest conference of Slovaks, Germans, Hungarians, Finnish, and Danish are simply recognized. Uh, another younger example of this is a declaration um, of the ELCA to people of African uh, descent where, again, um, it is underlined the equation of all members of the Church in Christ, and the ELCA goes further in apologizing to the people of African descent for its historical complicity in slavery. It recognizes the existence of institutional racism within its own institution. For example, when it comes to court processes, compensation of clergy, systemic policies, and organizational practices. So here we have also the first um, thing that should... Um, 
strike us while I was speaking about the diversity politic on the one hand, uh, on the institutional level of the ELCA, we do have problems uh, on the basis. And I experienced that also in Philadelphia when I was told that, for example, um, con congregations uh, wouldn't like to have a gay pastor. Uh, some even didn't want to have a female pastor or it shouldn't, shouldn't be Uh, shouldn't be a black pastor. So these kind of um, difference con differences continue to exist on the ground, ground floor. And I want to show this to you, um, focusing on the German-speaking Lutheran congregations within the ELCA. So while I was saying that the ELCA represents some 1% of the U.S. population, again, out of this 1%, it's only 1% from 1% that is German-speaking today. That is to say some 90 congregations within the ELCA still practice Uh, German-speaking services on a regular basis, um, either exclusively German or, um, which is more often the case, they have a German service and after that uh, English service, or there are also mixed forms of bilingual services and cultural activities related to the German heritage. And as you can see on the picture here, uh, the 10% representation of Native Americans, um, African Americans, Asian and Uh, so on is not given in this case, but we are dealing with an all white, uh, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant um, community here. Most of the people are aging more than 65 years. As you can see in the picture of the sauerkraut supper here, the celebration of uh, this uh, uh, German meal that has the same name, Frauenverein, which is the Ladies Aid Society, is another example. And here we have an image of uh, Jubilee in New York's St. Paul Cathedral in 2016 that is maybe also depicting the fa same thing. So I hope I have the time to play this um, part of an interview that I took. And I hope that you will be able to hear it. Uh, no, lemonade or? Okay. Um, so, 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 When immigrants is I mean major part of the experience that affects what we would call the life cycle of a congregation. Mm -hmm. um, so Tabor was founded initially exclusively German speaking. Mm -hmm. I think they introduced uh, an English service in the 30s, um, and then. Um, was still primarily a German service with an English service basically for the children of, right, of immigrants. Right. Um, and then uh, then the neighborhood changed very dramatically. Um, the Germans basically moved out from around this neighborhood and moved out into the Northeast yeah. um, for, by and large. So uh, if you listen to the history of Emmanuel, You know, they were down in Frankfurt, down in a neighborhood not far from right. here. Um, and then at some point decided that the people were moving. They wanted to move where the people were. Right. Um, Tabor stuck it out here. Um, but now there are very few Germans. Um, and so that transition from being a German-speaking congregation to now a Lutheran congregation, but with a waning sense of the influence of German culture um, is is strong. Whereas in Emmanuel, it's still very much central to their identity that they that they celebrate German culture in, in their context. Right. Um, so they're kind of on a different place in the arc of what it what an immigration what a culture what a congregation does is it assimilates into a new context. Right. Yeah, and I wanted to play this in length to you because I find it so beautifully described um, how she's referring to that life cycle of ethnic churches that has also been described by uh, an author by the name uh, Mullins in 1987 as something that can be interpreted uh, going from uh, stage to stage. So as I was saying in the beginning, for example, could have been German speaking services in the first stage and then bilingual services of both German and English um, in the second phase, whereas Again, in the third phase, it's monolingual, which would be English-only services. And this represents a transformation from ethnic to multi-ethnic organizations, as described by Mullins uh, 30 years ago. Uh, and now I have to jump to my conclusion. What are we to learn from that? 
Despite its affirm affirmations and ambitions, the ELCA remains the second monolithic church in the USA when it comes to ethnicity and race. The second monolithic uh, following a black only church, that is to say the second monolithic church when it comes to um, ethnicity and race. Racist resentments can be observed, for example, in the white flight that served as a means to avoid multi-ethnic and multicultural exchange to a certain extent. As expressed in this interview, uh, people were moving out once the neighborhood got diversified. With the German-speaking Lutherans attending the service being in their 70s and 80s, it can be expected that the bilingual state of the art will change to an all-English service in the forthcoming years. And now we have the necessity to fill the, uh, fill the pews of the church, and uh, that might get along with the diversification of the membership, I guess. Of course, the notion of ethnicity is not limited to factors like, like outer appearance, but it can be claimed that bodies continue to serve as signs of difference as well as indifference in this context. Barth said uh, ethnic distinctions do not depend on an absence of social interaction and acceptance, but are quite on the contrary, often the very foundations on which embracing social systems are built. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you and fantastic topic and actually perfect timing for us then. And now I'm giving the voice again back to you as Clara confirmed, she will be able to present now. Yes, I'm here. Uh, I'm trying to, um, sh I can only see you. I cannot see me. I don't know. I'm trying to share my screen where, um, okay, Torsten, would you like to introduce Clara in the meantime? Sorry? Torsten, Torsten will be introducing you and I hope he, okay. during that time I, you can... Uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. It's just that I'm... Uh, can you see my screen now? Not yet. Uh, no. Oh, uh, I just... At the bottom, you have this share screen. Yeah, I know. I, uh, Anna, I've done, it, I've done it a million times, but my... Yeah. The thing I want to show does not show. Why does not no. show? Okay, let's be calm and try once more. Uh, it's just the, the the document I want does not show. Why doesn't it show? That's my question because it should be here. I have to close it. I had it open. Perhaps that's why. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me see. I cannot. I, I, I've never. I have not shared screen in. Um, in WAVA, I've only uh, oh. shared it in, I've oh. shared it many times in Zoom, so I have it here, but uh, the stupid... Um, uh, did you log in via Zoom? Uh, no, I, I, I went in via WAVA. Okay, let, just present me and I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to figure it out, just present it. Just just present me and I'll, I'll figure it out, I think, I hope. <laughs> Sorry, I have to mention the sharing might not work if you are logged in, I mean, if you've uh, clicked the uh, meeting via Whova, you have to be on Zoom for that to work oh. out. But how so do I get Clara, Zoom? Maybe uh, you go I out and come back uh, with Zoom. But how do I get in with Zoom? I need a link. I've, I, I was in, in CF all these days through Whova. How do I get in through Zoom? When you open uh, on Whova the, uh, the session page, it yes. has the option to join either via Whova or via Zoom. The Whova okay, version but, is... But, then, but then, I, then I need a link, no? No, you don't. It's, it's you, you okay, click okay, 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 I mean, okay, the okay. link is on the Whova page. All right. Okay, so I'll get out and come in again. Okay, why don't you go ahead and present me? Um, yeah. I hate that. I really must say I hate technology. Now I cannot get out. How does this thing let me get out? I want to get out. <laughs> I want to get out and I'm not able to get out. I did this yesterday so many times. Why doesn't it work now? I guess it does not let me get out. It does not let me get out. How do I get out? Leave on the bottom bottom right of your screen. You have leave. Yeah, I know. And it doesn't it's allow not, you. It doesn't allow me to leave. <laughs> I have to stay with us. I'm clicking again. I click and it doesn't let me leave. Why? Can I ask for technical help? Why doesn't it let me leave? I'm clicking uh, leave. That sounds strange. Hmm. I'm clicking leave and it just doesn't get me out. I want to leave to be able to get in through Zoom. 
It does not let me out. I'm still there. I can see I can see myself on the screen. Leave meeting. Leave. Leave. I'm clicking. I've clicked 10 times on leave. This is very strange. Hmm. Oh. Well, no. It worked. Right, so she disappeared. We hope she will be back very soon. Yes. So that's maybe Thurston, would you be able to present Clara just as well uh, when she connects? Yeah. Or oh, she is typing a message. She's working at the University of Lisboa on religion and ritual, religion and heritage. She has both studied the aforementioned topics in West Africa as well as in European context and going to be speaking to us about how perfect can you be, genetic enhancement, body modifications, practices, and God, if God allows her. Yes, she is connecting. Thank you very much to the panel organizers and to everyone. I'm sorry for this technological screw up because I'm really bad with this. Anyway, my paper is entitled, How Perfect Can You Be? Genetic Enhancement, Body Modification Practices and God. And it actually ties in very well with what Thorsten was presenting now on ELCA. So basically this, um, this um, paper um, is part of a, a, a bigger project that is actually directed by my colleague at the Institute for Social Sciences in the University of Lisbon, Chiara Pusetti. And the name of the project is um, Excel, the Pursuit of Excellence, Biotechnologies, Enhancement and Body Capital in Portugal. And basically, the, the project looks at, you know, body enhancement, both from a cognitive point of view, you know, things that you can take to be clever, to remember better, like, um, like for instance, medicine students use a lot, medical students, but also um, bodily modifications such as, you know, putting on your uh, bottom, your tits, sorry for the expression, your nose, all the modifications you can do to your body to enhance it. And um, in this project, there are about 15 researchers and I'm doing the religious part, of course, which is basically looking at religions and the way those religions look at the views of the, what body modification is and what body enhancement practices entail and what can be and cannot be done according to different rules in different religions. So basically, we are, I'm, I'm trying to analyze how the conceptualization of the body mirrors religious rules and norms, but can also be used for challenging, transgressing, and reformulating those rules. That's why this ties into the breaking the rules theme of this Congress. So um, in, in the abstract, I think I mentioned several religions, but here today I'm just going to talk about the Afro-Brazilian religions because in 12 minutes I have no time to do the comparative bit. Um, so basically, uh, as you probably know, there's this equation of beauty with like complexions, which is present all over the world and very much in Africa and diaspora communities. So this ties in both with Thorsten and Anna's work because I've worked a lot in Africa. And so has she, as, as a matter of fact, the photo behind me is from my old field work from many, many years ago from my PhD. It's body wrapping in Guinea-Bissau. I did my PhD on that. And those are my photos. Um, I'm sorry, I, I had to use them for a talk and now I cannot seem to get them out on Zoom. So anyway, so the, the, um, it, from the historical context, as you also know, generations of Africans and African descendants have been bludgeoned with notions of inferiority. And these markers of African identities have been labeled and ruled as primitive, ugly and undesirable, especially with regards to beauty vis-a-vis -vis the white norm, right? So uh, diaspora contributed to mutate colonial representations and standardized ideals or rules of beauty across time and distance. And, and still, of course, uh, a lot of African people use body enhancement techniques to achieve the looks that conform to Eurocentric standards or rules. Uh, you know, for instance, to get jobs to feel that they are, if they are in the diaspora, to feel that they are more uh, related to the context they are in. And so many people in Africa, and unfortunately not only in Africa, in Asia, all over the world, develop serious medical problems and die due to recurrent use of products to whiten the skin, as hydroquinone, quinona, etc. Um, so basically there are current challenges in Africa and the diaspora 
uh, relating to uh, this multiple religions and cultural groups in Africa and in the diaspora and how do they relate to these issues? How do religious transnationalisms dialogue with or confront cultural modernism and the willingness of individuals to be modern and have modern bodies accepting diversity? So the rule of being white and, uh, you know, Western um, kind of clashes with the idea that, for instance, uh, Thorsten was talking about now, the idea of diversity, accepting to be black. And of course, this is nowadays uh, very much on the spot, the, the, the proud to be black. It has not, it's not just the, something from now, as you know, it has been going on fortunately for decades. But what I'm trying to see in this project is how these things clash. Okay, so the case of the Afro-Brazilian religions, as you know, the Afro-Brazilian religions came, well, from came with, with um, slave traffic. Uh, so it's a mixture of religions from Africa together with, uh, with Portuguese Catholicism in Brazil and with uh, original native religions in Brazil. So the Afro-Brazilian religions are nowadays a bit all over the world. Uh, they are very influenced uh, by Catholicism. They have a very um, strong connection with, the, with nature. Uh, they are religions of trans and altered states of consciousness. So people enter trans and they become the Orishas, the uh, Yoruba gods or somebody else. But they also have very strict rules. It's just that that's something that would be another paper. The fact that they have strict rules, but at the same time, they do accept uh, some freedom and they do talk about the liberty that people have. So how does that work when body comes and body rules come along? Um, so just to show you some photos from my fieldwork in Lisbon, these are some uh, candomblé rituals so that you get acquainted with it. Um, and this is uh, the photos I was showing now. It's candomblé, more African-like. But then you have the Umbanda, which is another variant. There's a lot of variants of, of Afro-Brazilian religions. And this is just another one that is more related to Catholicism. So there's two sides to this. There's charity and spiritual enhancement with rules to follow. And then there's the bodily enhancement. And I will just go quickly to that. So charity, for instance, especially in Umbanda, uh, the people that are um, that enter the altered states of consciousness and receive these African entities, they do a lot of charity. They, like, as you can see here, they do consultation to people who need help, as you can see in these photos. Okay. Um, so, oops, uh, did I do something wrong? The, the the screen disappeared. Can you see the screen? Can you just do a thumb up if you? Okay. So they they do this uh, charity uh, consultation, etc. But what happens, so that's the spiritual enhancement, okay? They help people. So what happens when the rules of the body uh, are, are concerned, female bodies and the perfect body? And of course, this respects a lot to the issue of female and male. So this is, for instance, here, Yemanja. Yemanja is the Orisha of the sea waters. And you can see here uh, an image of a black Orisha on the right and an image of a white uh, Yemanja on the left. Uh, an image being sold in the shops where, um, you know, other funerary articles and saints are sold. And you can see the aspect of this white or even the black, of course, Yemanja, as a very sensuous, uh, beautiful woman with a beautiful body, right? And uh, even here you have the uh, more images of, of Yemanja, the black Yemanja coming out of the waters, the white Yemanja on a surfboard, because of course now as Maria Santa, who's there knows, a surf is very important uh, in Portugal. So Yemanja may also surf the sea waters. But what I want to really stress here is this body that you see here is a sensuous female body full of, uh, you know, uh, body enhancement uh, relating to my to the project, totally different as you can see in this image from the image of Our Lady of Fatima, which is you know the Virgin Mary with no sensual characteristics, with a with a, a body that actually does not show. And I put the the images here one in front of the other, so you can see the big difference between one and the other. Here's an other, other female Orishas uh, like Yansan, also very sensual with the, her breasts showing. And Yansan and Santa Barbara, you know, there's this connection between the African Orishas and the, and the saints, the Catholic saints. So Yansan and Santa Barbara, once again, you can see the same thing as with Our Lady of Fatima and Yamanja, the Catholic saint in a position to the beautiful and sensuous um, um, African uh, goddess. Mm. 
I'm trying to I'm trying to switch to move on. Okay, so there's an enhanced female body and power that is shown here in the African images, which you don't have in the, of course, in the Catholic version. So, last last part, um, spiritual enhancement or body enhancement. So the, the bodies in trance of uh, when people are uh, possessed by these orishas are beautiful bodies in trance, as you could see in the first photos I showed you. You know, people uh, dress up with the orishas clothing, which are always very colorful, colorful and beautiful. So there is this body uh, enhancement, spiritual, as we could see in the charity in Umbanda, but also physical, candomblé and African gods as beauty, as beautiful. Sorry. But still, the model of goddess is very often a Western ideal. If you look at this African, um, African Orishas, still the body is the Western idea of the female body, you know, uh, slim, athletic, the model that we have nowadays, okay? If you go back to the 16th century, it would not be this. You know, slim, athletic, uh, well well cut, etc. But then uh, there's also the issue of transgressing bodily and religious rules. There's uh, these religions, besides the freedom, they also have a lot of control in rituals according to religious rules, like all religions do, of course. All religions make you do things that go according to their rules and not only. And so the last uh, thing I wanted to touch upon, the last um, topic or vignette, is the case of transsexuals and bodily changes. As um, Afro-Brazilian religions are actually very prone to having uh, transvestites, transsexuals, etc. And there's a whole discourse on Afro-Brazilian religions and uh, also a, a very large um, literature by anthropologists and not only as Peter Fry in Brazil, but also others talking about uh, the, and, and the classical Ruslan's work in, in Bahia, uh, in Northeast Brazil, about the preeminence of homosexuals in Afro-Brazilian religions. So I have just two quotes here to finish and then wrap up um, of, of, of people I've interviewed. And one of them says, in the Afro-Brazilian religions, everyone has a place, LGBT, homosexuals, transsexuals. It is wrong to think that a transsexual is less worthy of receiving an orisha. And another one who is actually a, a female main saint. Main saint is the mother of saints. She's the religious leader, okay? But she's a, 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 tra a transsexual. So she says, I became a woman. She was a man before. Because I felt like a woman encapsulated in a man's body. Although to my orisha, what matters is my origin as a male in the terreiro. The terreiro is the temple. Everyone treats me as mother G. Well, I'm, not, I'm just not saying her name. This shows the emotional attachment my sons and daughters, sons of daughters of saints. That's the name of the people who are the followers. Uh, so they are under the authority of the mother of saint and they are the sons and daughters of saints. The, so that shows the emotional attachment my sons and daughters have towards me and how for them I am indeed a mother of saint. It does not matter what I was when I was born, but what I am now. And okay, so let me get out of the full screen um, or just go back to this image. Uh, I, I like this one, the Our Lady of Fatima and, Orish, and the and the and the Yemanja. So I'm just going to wrap up now. This is I, I must stress work in progress. The project started uh, just uh, two years ago, and I, I'm still doing a lot of work, especially because, of course, due to COVID, I could not do a lot of field work last year, and still this year I've been doing as almost everybody through Zoom and telephone, but um, not with the Afro-Brazilian religions that where I've been working with for 15 years, but other religions. So in order to make a comparison, um, but this is the case I wanted to talk to you about how these religions uh, break the rules in the sense that, um, well, uh, a lot of other religions are, are more close to bodily modifications as far, for instance, as, uh, transsexuals go and how this Afro-Brazilian religions are kind of uh, enter an ambiguous and bit contradictory field in the sense that on the one hand they sh show and they uh, prefer these models of the beautiful female body like Iemanja and at the same time they say yes but we we accept transsexuals and we accept the bodily modifications that being a transsexual entails. This is it, but it's work in progress. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Clara. 
Now, finally, after I have this to get out of here. I have to get out of this share screen. Uh, okay, okay, uh, and okay. I I've done it. I think. Okay. All right. You? Thank you. Well, thank you for your patience for my technological uh, dumbness. Having listened to these five, um, well. I was listening to four papers and I liked them a lot. I was about to say, having listened to these five beautiful papers, <laughs> uh, we now finally have the chance to talk about them and the floor is open to any kind of question. And <clears throat> if I don't say any right now, I'm going to start. And I wanted to ask um, Alexi um, two things. Um, I wasn't familiar with this database you were talking about, which is called SK, SKVR database. And then next thing you were saying uh, was that you want to understand it in the context of lived religion. And I was asking myself, which kind of sources uh, would you use in order to do so? Yes, um, thank you for your question. So, um, yeah, I hope my, yeah, my microphone is on. Uh, so this database is uh, volumes that were published in the beginning of the 19th century, uh, the Suomen Kansan Vanhatrona, so the ancient poems of the Finnish um, uh, Finnish people uh, that comprise all the, um, uh, not, not all, but a selection of uh, different genres of Kalevala meter poems, so epic poems, lyrical, uh, incantations, and, and all kinds of uh, children's poem and everything. And uh, in since the 90s, uh, they have been then digitized um, and uh, published online as well. So you can do searches and, and there are different uh, ways of using those, those digital poems. So they, uh, they cover like the whole territory of Finland and regions from Russia that uh, where poems were collected in the 19th century and it's uh, really like thousands of, of uh, poems I don't remember exactly uh, the, the figures but it's, it's really a lot of, of poems and about the sources that I use so uh, in addition to the incantations themselves uh, I use also folklore collections like narrative material uh, from from the 19th century as well that was collected and that is um, uh, preserved in the archives of the Finnish Society Literature uh, in, in Helsinki and that can help me uh, contextualize uh, the, the charms and understand how they were used in the context of, of this religion as of course I can't um, interview my, my informant so I hope I answered your questions. You have, thank you very much. And Maria has raised her hand and wanted to ask a question. Nice to have you here. Yeah. Good morning. Can morning. you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good morning. Um, I I wrote a question to Anna. Okay. Can you see it? All right. And the question yes. to Clara also. Uh, this Yamanja on the surfboard. Is she from uh, Brazil? Uh, could you uh, give me more details? I'm quite intrigued by that uh, that uh, picture of a uh, Yamanja on the surfboard. Thank you both. Uh, actually, yes. So should I start, Thorsten? <laughs> Yeah, you, yeah. You okay, so we, we are indeed having also questions on chat. I see one from, from Maria. So uh, the question is, can you tell us about men's clothes which are accepted for a religious event? Uh, well, what I was doing, I was doing research, especially among Catholic groups, but broader, I can say Christian groups in Ghana, in, in West Africa. I had one picture with males uh, where they were something which, in, especially in central and south part of Ghana, is treated as a very important dress in various contexts, also in the church, but it, it comes from the so-called traditional context and especially chieftaincy. So the royal traditions and royal families. So the full 
piece of cloth, so called, which is wrapped around the male's body. They were only shorts under that, and the one arm is being kept bare. Uh, so this is exactly something which people would say, okay, it's uh, it's our African way. But it's uh, by Christian, it is being used very, very uh, often during important religious celebrations, especially after funerals, etc. And it's very often covered in special patterns. So so-called Adinkra symbols, which are from the, again, Ashanti culture, which are various symbols that supposedly they recall certain proverbs. And interestingly, I saw on the Thorsten uh, presentation, one of the most popular and also politicized Adinkra symbol on the book cover on those, uh, I think, African-Americans, um, Sankofa, this bird turning to, to the tail, which is interpreted, we are coming back to roots. So uh, it's a combination of those, well, uh, Ghanaian nationalist discourse from post-independence, African invention of the African identity and also pan-African identity and Christian identity. But of course, people can wear different things also like suits, various t-shirts with also various prints. Uh, so males would very often select uh, in Catholic context images of male saints, so like Saint Joseph, uh, Saint Anthony, or recently John Paul II is also quite uh, quite popular as a part of attires. So thank you for your question, Maria. Uh, uh, Anna, one further question on the same issue. Uh, did you mention men also may wear just usual uh, normal T-shirts? Yes. Yes, of course. Uh, but very often, especially if people have money, because it's also a matter of money, they would love to uh, adore it with something. So it can be even a T-shirt, but like with sort of like Christian saying, proverb, or in case of Catholics, also images appear. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so to answer, should I answer now, Thorsten? Yeah. Okay, so uh, to, to Maria Santa's question, well, uh, Maria Santa, the thing is that uh, these images that I put together, some of them like the image of Our Lady of Fatima in the shop, in the, as you know, as I do, because we're both Lisboners and Portuguese, uh, the, the images, the iconography, the, the physical iconography, the images of, of saints are, were sold only in funerary shops up till uh, 30 years ago, okay? And then uh, when the Brazilian um, migration started coming to Portugal, this was about, well, 30 years ago, uh, you know, 80s, 1980s, 1990s. Then we started having a lot of esoteric shops. Uh, we, we call them that way. There's actually uh, all sorts of things being sold there, you know, incense, esoteric books, books on, uh, uh, you know, bodily practices, uh, spiritual enhancement, but also a lot of, um, of images. Uh, and, and of course, then, then when the Afro-Brazilian religions also migrated from Brazil to Europe and especially to Portugal, because a lot of Brazilians came here since we have this special relation with Brazil, there was a colony of Portugal up till 1822. Of course, uh, other type of shops opened that are also these esoteric shops, but um, with a, a strong emphasis on Afro-Brazilian religion. So they will be called the House of Orishas or something like that. And there you have all sorts of things that you can use in Afro-Brazilians or African religions rituals. They exist here also because we all have a lot of people coming from the former African colonies that became independent after the revolution of 74. So they became independent in 75. Of course, I'm explaining this not for Maria Santa, but for all the others that are not Portuguese. And so what happens is you have shops now. So these images are not are nowadays not only sold in funerary agencies, uh, funerary parlors, but also in all these esoteric and Afro-Brazilian shops. Okay. So the iconography, you can you can indeed have an image of Our Lady of Fatima besides the image of Yemanja, like the one I showed, you know, the beautiful white woman with the, the big breasts and the old sculptural body, okay? The other images I showed, which were the iconography from, you know, it's from basically from the internet, you find all sorts of images. You throw in Yemanja and there are 
millions of images of Yamanja, both black Yamanjas, white Yamanjas. And so that one of Yamanja on the surfboard, I found in the internet. So I cannot tell you, I'm sure it is Brazilian origin because although all the Afro-Brazilian temples here in Portugal have their own sites, most of them have their own sites, just like the ones in Brazil, of course, the quantity of temples and sites in Brazil is uh, a tremendously larger than the one in Portugal because Brazil is huge and it's the the home of this religions, of this um, syncretic religion. So yes, so um, I found it in the internet, but it makes all the sense because, you know, Yemanja is the goddess of the seawaters. The ritual to commemorate mm -hmm. Yemanja is done on the ocean, in the ocean. So in Brazil, it's normally December or February here in Portugal. People also go to the sea to, to, ba to bath and to give gifts to Yemanja, like flowers and fruits. Uh, uh, at the end of December or February, but a lot of the temples choose to do it at the end of September when it's not as cold and the water is not as cold. They still go in with swimming, you know, with the surf suits. But so all the rituals for Yamanja are in the sea, in the ocean, and we are a country <laughs> with a huge ocean, <laughs> so a huge coast. So yes, it's not surprising that Yamaja shows up on a surfboard. I know it interests you because I know you study the surf religion, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, but this is the Af Afro-Brazilian uh, Yamaja Orisha on a surfboard. And I, I think that's a fantastic image, you know? Yeah. There, uh, beautiful, once again, with that sculptural body on top of a, a surfboard, so. Thank you, Claudia. Very, very interesting. <laughs> I also had a question for Anna, but I don't know if. Yes, please. You have to switch on your microphone, Clara. I didn't no. know if there was somebody who wanted to ask something before I did, since I just spoke. Uh, there were no uh, okay. questions. questions. Okay, I, I thought. Oh, Mer Mercia has one, but okay. I'll just quick ask Anna. I, I thought that was really interesting, and me and Anna shared this thing that we both work in European context and African context, so we are double <laughs> divided in double things. And and I, you know, I I really liked your paper because I've lived through that, and I always, of course. My daughter keeps saying, mom, you cannot buy more cloth once you go to Africa because there's boxes uh, full of them. And I say, yes, but they are so interesting. They are so interesting because that's the thing about this creativity in this African uh, tissues is that they are totally creative. I don't know if you guys listened to a series on religion and crisis that was put together by... Um, by Christina Rocha and uh, Ina was there and Richard Strokes from Australia and uh, actually Brigitte Meyer was the first talker uh, uh, and she was showing exactly one, I think in Nigeria, one of those tissues that had the coronavirus, um, one of them had the coronavirus symbol and then the other one, the, the, the inter interconnections and the of that the coronavirus uh, um, triggers. So it's so interesting. Now, the funny thing is, as you know, most of these uh, tissues are not made in Africa. We call them African, but they are not made there. They are made elsewhere before they were made even in Europe, in Holland, for instance. But now I think they are done probably in China or somewhere in the East where it's cheaper to manufacture them. Of course, we are talking about these tissues that are industrially made because, for instance, in Guinea-Bissau, where I work, and I'm sure in Ghana also, there are handmade ones that are made locally, but they are totally different. They are made in the, in the uh, what's the name, the oven. Day and day. Yes, exactly. So, but what I found fascinating in yours is once again, that creativity of, of, of the, the claws, of the tissue, of the idea that they put. So it's like, uh, it's really interesting, as you were saying, it, 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 it's like embodying the rule in your own dress. So the, the, the man who offered you that, of course, wanted you to really embody the idea of his church and, and all that. But uh, my question is very simple and very practical, Anna. Have you worn it in Poland? <laughs> what, would be, what would be the reaction of people? Because here in Portugal, I wear my African dresses, mainly when I'm home. 
Today, it's not really African, but often I wear my African dresses at home. But if I take them outside, well, people might look at me, but we are used here to seeing so many African people wearing them because we have a lot of people from Guinea, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my question. And what was the outcome if you did wear it? Uh, it's always this question, what, what to wear being an ethnographer? But, you know, that's true. I also bring a lot of stuff. I also got get many presents and, you know, dresses are such a common present and also have many friends friends who are uh, dressmakers, so seamstresses, and I truly think they are amazing. When you think about creativity, uh, w when I come now to Ghana, I would love to make more interviews with seamstresses because what they invent is just absolutely amazing. Yeah, but in Poland, I, I would never probably wear the crucifixion or crucifixion dress. Uh, and there are jokes like my family told me, oh, you just walk uh, in that dress on the street and you will get beaten. <laughs> By by real Polish Catholics, <laughs> because for them it would be like an orphan. But indeed, you know, now uh, to Krakow, there are some African pilgrimages also to Krakow to uh, the Divine Mercy Shrine. And sometimes at the airport, you can see African pilgrims in those dresses with the images of the Divine Mercy of the Christ, etc. But yes, it's definitely I don't look uh, like an. African pilgrim, but I do wear dye, dye and um, tie and dye, uh, but well, more like universal style, not like so-called African proper. Yeah, I don't wear them in in Krakow. Even in the field, I because people make fun of me. Oh, you a bruni white person, you wearing the African dress, uh, you look funny. So I usually select something that is you know in between, mm -hmm. uh, which is very also comfortable for me to wear. Mm -hmm. uh, which I love because it's beautiful, but... <laughs> but you know, Anna, you know, Anna, tie and dye yeah. are now, I don't know how it is in Poland, yeah, but tie and dye is now, since last year, it became yeah. really fashionable. Everybody, yeah. even the top boutiques are having tie and dye type yeah. of dress. But the so one I was referring, wear. yeah, but the one I was referring to in Guinea Bissau, I'm sure they exist also in Ghana, is beyond this wax, they call them wax tissues. Yeah, wax print, yeah. Yeah, wax prints or yeah. the tie and dye, you also have the handmade in, um, yeah. you know, the tiar. Tiar is, what's the name of tiar in English? I, can't, I forget. I don't know, woven things also. Yeah, the are. woven things. Yeah, exactly. And so... And so uh, those are the really traditional and much the uh, made in the loom. That's the word. Yes, I yes. So woven things. Yes. Yeah, so like no, can, uh, and those yeah. are much more expensive. In, in and, of, and and they are normally a geometric pattern. So you could even yes. have dress made out of it. It's just I'm thinking of all well, this particular type of um, pattern, like the crosses and all that. It, it would definitely look I'm, I'm sure people would stare at you because oh, and it's so interesting because what we are saying, yes, yes, this wax prints and others are made, you know, in Asia and China, whatever, yeah. but, but the people, but that's the thing I think we should probably research is the idea of the print is not made in China. You know, like, for instance, in Guinea-Bissau, you have those prints with the image of Amilcar Cabral, who is a hero of the national uh, of nationalism and of the uh, fight against Portuguese. So the ideas come from the African countries. They just so I'm wondering who designs them. You know, there has to but be designers. I don't Sorry? want to make too much time, but it's so complex because your the design really started of when we talk about wax prints with mostly Dutch designers. I know, I know. Yes. With but being design. inspired by some... African eight items they, they could approach. And nowadays it's very complex because it's really like global global network. Yeah. Uh, some of them are designed in like in West Africa, in Ghana, because there are still existing factories having some troubles because of the Chinese production. But it's yeah. uh, indeed it's a big, big topic though. Yes, it is. Uh, we should have a project this. on that. It's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> global circulation. Okay, so we, we took a lot of time. <laughs> Uh, as I understand, Mircea had a question to pose. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Great job, everybody. Congratulations to all. A um, uh, short question for you, Torsten. Uh, very, very interesting, the, the, the example you gave, the, the community you study. Uh, and it's interesting because, uh, you know, uh, displaying such a progressive theology out loud uh, automatically sets you in conflict with various denominations, not only Catholics, but also evangelicals, right? So in the States, it's very tension situation. So I, I'm wondering how do they, they manage this, you know, because paying the price, you know, the public price for that, uh, for that uh, uh, progressive theology and not or for, for a reason or another, not succeeding in being that inclusive as they seek to be. So I'm sure they, they also understand that. 
some somehow and how do they manage this do how do they try to to go uh, towards what they uh, they want to be so so to say thank you thank you so what i discovered is that there's a tension between the center and the basis you can compare it to those people in brussels uh, what they do in the european union to our countries and they refer to the louvre tower in chicago as the basis of the elca where people in chicago decide about things that matter to us but uh, we don't agree upon with uh, you are correct to say that this progressive theology is also causing tensions with other churches within the united states such as the lcms which is the lutheran um, church missouri synod and um, another predecessor church before the merger in 1988 and they for example had problems with the um, pulpit uh, union with the elca um, celebrating masses together with them for reasons such as the affirmation of uh, homosexuality and such uh, uh, issues and when you take a look at the short history of the elca since 1988 which is some 33 years now um, they have been struggling with their self mostly and um, i'm not quite sure how this is going to um, end up um, i guess there's also a connection between the democratic party um, people that are engaged in the Democratic Party as opposed to people being engaged in the Republican Party who would be uh, represented in other kinds of churches. And you could also see the minority politics being pushed forward by Hillary Clinton in the last um, campaign that I think also caused some trouble for the Democratic Party. And I guess there's a relation here to actually focus on minority politics. So uh, I guess there's more to say to this, but I should leave the room for other people as well. Thank you for your question. And I had one question, if that's possible, to Bartosz. Um, you were saying that um, what you experienced uh, about St. Rita and Schabe can be called a, an experiential laboratory of spiritual experience. Is that your description of the scene, or is that something that people would say when describing what they do? Uh, thank you for the question. No, this is um, this is my um, my opinion and my observation. Um, devotees um, uh, who participate uh, in uh, in devotees um, didn't uh, uh, say that. Um, I only observe uh, how um, they uh, use um, body, how they use these material items, and then. Um, uh, when I uh, spoke, uh, uh, when I uh, speak with them, um, I asking um, what they feel, what, what they um, um, understand, what they ex uh, experience uh, are, but um, they um, didn't name it. Anna, you look like you wanted to say something. Well, I will be like sort of short two questions. I put them on the chat, but maybe, well, if we have, one would be for Clara about the body and Marian body. So is there an influence in iconography, images, statues of Mary? Maybe also functioning outside of the Roman Catholic context, because I know it does happen, uh, like influenced by this Orisha's imaginary. And for Bartosz, if Bartosz is just uh, answering, I'm always wondering and asking Bartosz, is there a uh, gender issue with Saint Rita being, well, very feminine oriented and, and Saint Charbel obviously being a male saint? Uh, so is there any gender issue uh, when, when you just observe devotions related to both of those popular saints working in sort of like similar domains? So We can have a few more minutes. That's what we know from our wonderful Nomadit support volunteer, Vilma, I think, uh, was the name of... Uh, should I answer first? Should I go first, Bartos? Okay, um, so it, it's quick. Yeah, in, as a matter of fact, I think it was visible in the in the slides I showed that you know the Virgin Mary, as you know, is you know white, very white, a beautiful, perfect face, 
pure face uh, once again by European Western standards of the white uh, classical beauty, but you don't see her body. No, I have not seen thus far images of a sensual uh, Our Lady of Fatima. Our Lady of Fatima is always shown with those veils and, you know, hands in, in, a, in a sacred position, a beautiful face, white, but no body, you know, no breasts, no bottoms, no ankles uh, showing, okay? And, uh, and, and so, no, I would say no. And as a matter of fact, uh, as you know, Anna, from our previous project where we were in Fatima, uh, Fatima is nowadays uh, a bit of an ecumenical space in the sense that not only Catholics go there, but also people from other religions, including Afro-Brazilians, including African religions, including pagans, uh, who are uh, very much in the line of the work of Ana Fedeli, women, for instance, who, um, who consecrate themselves to female deities, but female in the sense of neo-paganism, the female beauty as a whole and the power of, of, of the female. So Fatima is now very contested, but as you know also, there are sides of the Catholic Church that accept that economy, ecumenism and the fact that other religions go there and are very open to that, but there are sides of the Catholic religion uh, that of the status quo that do not accept that and prefer to stick to the, you know, uh, official uh, Catholic saints and Catholic norms. So th this is my answer to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for for the question. Um, I think that um, cult of Santrita is really um, uh, is really um, um, females cult. So Santrita is is um, uh, very um, active and very uh, strong female uh, person, uh, really strong uh, characters. And um, I think that here is um, uh, here is a place of or sphere uh, for um, for uh, a woman, women um, uh, who uh, who ask, who pray to Santrita. Um, well, um, especially um, interest is the not obvious patronate of Santrita uh, when the Rita is um, uh, a patron, a patroness of um, whole, hopeless and unhappy love uh, that must be ended. Uh, so uh, a, a lot of young uh, uh, women uh, pray to to end love, to end um, difficult relationship, uh, or um, um, uh, Santrita is always uh, is also um, patroness um, of um, how to say di divorce. Um, often uh, women uh, ask them, pray uh, um, to, uh, uh, for um, good uh, um, uh, uh, to, to help uh, and um, good end of uh, divorce process. It is interesting because it's not so much in line with official Roman Catholic policy, let's say it. Okay, thank you, Bartosz. Alexei, did you want to ask something? Uh, yes, if I if I have some time still, um, I well I, I would have many questions, but uh, maybe I just one comment and one question. So um, the comment is to to Clara uh, as you used the word uh, transsexual in your presentation, and um, uh, just I I think that generally speaking nowadays the preferred word at least in the LGBT communities uh, is uh, transgender and instead of uh, transsexual so uh, just a, a little little thing so so um, uh, well you you are totally right it's just that in Portuguese we don't have the word gender so uh, uh, I use transsexual because that's the word uh, we use in Portuguese we don't have the word gender so uh, yeah you can say transgenero but it's not as much used it I know you are right and I apologize for that but it was because to translate it it would it was just I didn't want to translate what the word that people used. It was themselves that used. Okay. Yes. No, that, that's what I, I suppose as well. And I, as I don't know Portuguese, I. I, I mm. But uh, yeah, just uh, like yeah, that was just a little comment. And then uh, the question that I'd like to ask uh, Anna is about uh, the conflicts or the possible conflicts that happen if people do not wear 
uh, those proper African dresses, uh, what, what happens? Oh, thank you, Alexia. I will try to be very brief. Of course, there are many, well, pensions uh, and discussions, of course, or the unofficial way how to criticize someone not wearing a proper a proper cloth to the to the church. It does appear, um, but the conflict really appears. Um, well, you can wear different things uh, if they are uh, treated as, you know, you try to look festive. So I even saw, again, males in pyjamas. So like secondhand European pyjamas, of course, they didn't know the original use of pyjamas. They were very nicely washed, ironed and used as a sort of suits in the church. And it was, of course, uh, accepted as a sort of uh, proper, proper cloth. Uh, discussions appear about uh, females and wearing too sexually um, showing dresses. So it's, of course, this thing which appears. And then there are, well, answers, okay, I try to look beautiful to the God. And those are interesting things when this idea of the nudity, again, appears in the context of the Catholicism and other Christian denominations. So was, I was trying to be brief, but thank you. Thank you so much for your question. I think it's time to close uh, this session now. Um, as you know, we're going to have a second session related to the same topic, which is going to start in some two hours and eight minutes. Uh, you're most welcome to join us. Uh, thank you, everyone, especially conveners of this um, panel and also people that were listening and posing questions. Looking forward to see you again either in this forum in two hours or also, in the break, there's a possibility to join the working groups uh, in the lunch break if you are interested in that. Check the agenda on Hoover. And otherwise, we also invite you to become um, members of the working group uh, Ethnology of Religion. If you're interested in that, you can contact me or any other board member, such as um, Clara being present here. Uh, okay, and thank you all. Um, have a nice lunch break. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, uh, so, so we come back you. in 25 minutes, right? We come back yeah, it, is, it will be two o'clock in Helsinki, so you have to count if you live in another time zone. Oh. And one more announcement uh, about working group. There is also a quarter after 12 uh, working group posters and the working group of ethnology of religion poster will be presented. And I know that Victoria Hegner, co-chair of the working group, is going to be present, answer your questions. And um, so that's that's one more event. So I, I'm very you. sorry, but I do have a question. I thought that we were starting again in in 25 minutes because we have half no. an hour. No, yes. no, we, we start at two o'clock Helsinki time, which oh. means 12 p.m. Portugal. I thought the two sessions no. followed, you know, because uh, yesterday the panel I had was one session, half an hour break and another session. It's a young scholars network, so anyone who would okay. love to join us, please. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, 10, 10 o'clock in Portugal. Yeah, 12 o'clock. 10 o'clock. I, I don't know if I'll be able to be in because. No, I midday. Another midday. Midday. <laughs> uh, okay. midday in Portugal, Clara. So, yeah, I'll make the. Yo sei, mas é que eu tenho, eu tenho uma reunião de trabalho da universidade ao meio-dia. Okay. So we die in Portugal. So many things going on. It is this the Zoom life is killing us. I you know, you are often okay. in three meetings at the same time. <laughs> now we are unofficial, evidently. No, no, the, Anna, this is this is not CF. I've been in CF every day, but this oh, is no. a meeting from my university that I, I cannot skip. But I was convinced our second session was now. Yeah. So good thing I presented now because I would not be oh. able to. And I, thank I, you, Clara, so much because I I, I know it was a yeah, complicated situation. Oh, well. in the okay, thank you so much. Yeah. And we should thank our volunteer <laughs> from yes. Nomadit. Yeah. Thank you. See, Bye. See, see you during the second session. See thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Later. Bye. Two hours time. Bye. <laughs>